Hello, welcome to the Wildline Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. This is a podcast about movies and how much money they make at the box office. Today is the weekend review show for January 24th through the 26th, 2020. We have two new wide releases at the box office, The Gentleman and The Turning. We will do deeper dives on those, talk about what the critics thought and what audiences thought about these films, also how they performed financially this weekend at the box office. Uh, we'll talk maybe a little bit about award stuff. We're kind of out of the award season now, it feels like. I mean, the Oscars are coming up in what? Is it a week or two weeks? Something like that. So we'll briefly talk about the Oscars and what's going on with sort of the bumps that a lot of these movies have gotten from all their awards wins and award nominations. Uh, we have a Time Machine segment coming up from Chris. It's going to be awesome. And then we'll close out the show to talk about what's happening over the next few weeks at the box office. But let's dive right into it here with the top 10 uh, for the weekend of the 24th to 26th, 2020. Number one this weekend was Bad Boys for Life in its second weekend. Did $34 million this weekend. Awesome. Uh, 46% drop, which is pretty good. Uh, It's not like, I guess the average drop for a movie like this would be around 50%. So it's a little bit better than that. Uh, Per theater average was 9K per theater. Uh, It's doing quite well. $120 million here domestically so far. Uh, This one was a big surprise last weekend. Uh, It popped off at $62 million its opening weekend and has had a strong week. Uh, Did $10 million on Monday, $6 on Tuesday, about $4 on Wednesday, same on Thursday, uh, and then it sort of picked back up for the weekend. Um, You know, right now, it's way ahead of Bad Boys 2. Now, inflation not adjusted here. Uh, So at this point, Bad Boys 2 is at $88 million. But again, that was like, what, 17 years ago? It just like blows my mind. I was thinking about Bad Boys 2 when it came out July 2003 and how much the movie industry and box office has changed. You know, that movie had a $130 million production budget, ended up making $273 million worldwide. That doesn't sound amazing. It was a little bit of an underperformance, but like back then they would throw $130 million in a movie like this like it was nothing. Uh, because, you know, this is before comic book movies really took off. The biggest movies, at the block, the popcorn blockbusters, uh, like an Independence Day in the 90s uh, or Armageddon, stuff like that. It used to be these big action films with huge set pieces. And Bad Boys 2 was just like that. Bad Boys for Life kind of feels different now uh, because of all the comic book movie stuff going on. Uh, and all the big live action stuff that is happening that's, you know, Disney owns everything. They're like the top five movies last year. This just feels like a, a definitely like a throwback, not only to the early 2000s, but even more towards the 90s when Bad Boys the original came out in 1995. So I think it's a, a success because of that, because it does feel different. Uh, Martin Lawrence and Will Smith are obviously, you know, big draws. Will Smith being probably a much bigger draw now than Martin Lawrence, of course. But um, it's like people haven't forgotten these these two. And so they still have a lot of cachet culturally. And they've gotten people to show up for this. Uh, so this is a wonderful performance. Worldwide right now, Bad Boys for Life is at one. I guess that's 160 so far worldwide. So this will blow past Bad Boys 2. Um, you know, even adjusted inflation, uh, oh, in, uh, inflation adjusted domestic box office would be about 209 million, uh, total for bad boys too. Um, this shouldn't have a problem hitting that, uh, opened at 60, three X is 180. Eh, it should have a three X multiple. So maybe that's like a good goal for this movie is to hit that 209 domestic. I think it's got a chance. Uh, February is really light. Uh, Beside Birds of Prey, um, it's a really light February. So I think this has a good chance to sort of hit that old mark of what the original did, of course, uh, inflation adjusted. So uh, Bad Boys doing fantastic. Really big win for Sony. Uh, Is it a surprise? It was a surprise to me, not within the week of release. But like if you asked me a few months before, I didn't think it was going to do all that well. I kind of had a misread on it. Uh, I just didn't think there were going to be a big audience for something like that. But they did show up for it. Uh, so doing great here in the uh, its second weekend. Uh, number two this weekend was uh, 1917 Universal. Uh, just won the Director's Guild Award last night. Uh, has a very good chance of winning Best Picture. I think it's by far the favorite after that win. Uh, it suggests that the people that really vote for these awards, the directors, the producers, love it. Uh, I kind of had hoped that Parasite would be the dark horse here and win. Uh, I just don't see that happening now, despite the fact that they did win Best Ensemble at the SAG Awards, which is a really important award uh, that leads into the Oscars. But I just don't see it pulling off. I think 1917 is going to run away with Best Picture. What is really surprising, though, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this in the Oscars, is how quickly 
uh, Marriage Story and Irishman faded. Uh, it's kind of crazy, but we'll hold that for a little bit later when we talk about Oscars. So 1917, second this weekend, 15.8 million, wonderful 28% drop. That's all award stuff. If the, it had not won the award at the Golden Globes for Best Picture and didn't get all these other awards, it would not be dropping 28%. It'd be dropping like 50, 60%. Uh, it is now in its fifth uh, fifth uh, week of release. Uh, per theater average is four thousand dollars. Totals one oh three right now, which is pretty good. Uh, you know, it's a bigger action sort of war film, so it, it's got a higher budget. But um, you know, I, I, for a January release like this, I mean, technically it was released on Christmas, I think, wasn't it? In limited markets, so um, it's a pretty good pretty good run for this so far. And if it does win Best Picture, it's going to have similarly low drops. And like we're, February is really quiet, so it could really play strong all the way until spring, uh, until we hit March or something like that. So um, doing quite well right now for 1917, looking for that best picture win coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, number three was Doolittle, uh, 12.5 million, a 43% drop, right? So this one's already a flop. Everybody knows it. It's going to lose $100 million at least uh, for Universal. Uh, we talked about this one at length uh, last weekend. Kind of troubled production, um, unproven director at this level with this type of film. The guy directed Syriana. I love that movie, but this is not a Syriana. This is a big, uh, huge live action tentpole movie. So unproven there. Didn't go very well. Had to bring in another director, I think, to do reshoots extensive. Everybody said it was a shit show on set. Um, Robert Downey Jr. is probably the biggest reason this got greenlit. But I think at the end of the day, they're going to look back and be like, well, this is a huge mistake. Um, But it's actually not like... It's not a total disaster at the box office. So right now it's at uh, 44 million bucks, which is not good. It should have opened around that to sort of recoup its money, but that's not going to happen. So, but it's not at like $20 million. It's not at 30. I think it's it, it's doing all right for what it was. That is, you know that it's going to flop. You know it's going to be a disaster. It's not the worst disaster it could possibly be. It's just a it's a middling disaster at this point. Uh, so uh, but a good drop. You, you have to sort of give it credit. It is a children's film uh, in part. So I think that's why it's having a lower drop. Uh, so do little number three. Number four, uh, the new Guy Ritchie movie, The Gentleman from STX, did eleven million dollars, which is pretty good. Uh, per theater average is five uh, five K per theater. Um, so this one, uh, let's do a deeper dive on this one. Just check out what happened with the critics and stuff. So critics. Rotten Tomatoes, 72% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Actual score, 63 from all critics. Top critics were a little bit less loving on this. Uh, 53%, uh, I guess that's a rotten score, uh, and a 53 actual score, so they didn't like it as much. And again, this is Guy Ritchie's return to sort of like his bread and butter uh, crime caper film, I guess you'd call it. But it, it it's a crime caper, but it's not necessarily like an Ocean's 8 or Ocean's 11 or anything like that. It's a little bit more grimy about like, I kind of think of like East London. Uh, it, there's a little sort of that sort of um, uh, rhyme to it. It just has a different accent to the whole thing. Uh, Snatch obviously being probably the most famous example of one of his films um, that is like that. Verified audience score is an 88%. Really strong for this. 86 actual score. That's people who bought tickets on Fandango. They rated it on Rotten Tomatoes. 88% fresh, 86 actual score. All audience is essentially the same. A cinema score was a B plus, which is pretty solid. Um, you know, with that verified audience in the 88, you would think it would hit like an A minus, but it just didn't get there. Uh, and my guess on a movie like this, and we'll be talking about cinema score a lot this episode because of the turning. Um, we had another milestone there. Uh it, they're, I think, a little bit forgiving here in a movie like this. Um, a B plus is strong. Um, Post track was a 70%, which is okay. A 48% definite recommend, which is not so good. You want to be like around 50% definite recommend over that. Uh, a really good movie will hit low 70s. Definite recommend is one of those things where I could never really get a, a read on. I don't have a barometer for it until I started to look a lot closer at it. I had always thought that like, oh, like 80% definite recommend was like uh, uh, like where you wanted to be. But it sounds like that's outrageously high. Uh, it's almost like a letterbox where it's like if you're in the 80s, it's nuts. Um, but like from what I've seen the last few weeks, the last couple of months, you know, a lot of films end up in the high 50s, low 60s. If you do break that 70% definite, re- definite recommend mark on post track, you're doing quite, quite well. So the big breakouts like Bad Boys was low 70s. Uh, so 40% just seems a little low to me. A letterbox score from the film nerds, 72 out of 100, which is not that bad. That's pretty good. 
uh, Knives Out. I, similar comps here. I chose Knives Out, Ocean's 8, and Baby Driver. Just kind of crime caper films. Uh, Knives Out had an 82, beloved by film Twitter, so that makes sense. Uh, Ocean's 8 has a 64, Baby Driver has a 78. So it's in between Ocean's 8 and Baby Driver, which makes sense if you look at these other scores. So I think overall, critics were not ecstatic about it, but they didn't think it was terrible. Audiences are a little bit more uh, enamored with it, uh, but not like it's a masterpiece. It's just like a really good sort of, you know, kind of return to that old genre for Guy Ritchie. He is an expert at these films, you have to admit. Like he gets the pacing. He gets the sort of character interplays, the dialogue. Uh, it is sort of his form. So uh, I think he's just kind of hit, you know, a nice double here is what it is. Um, really low cost on this. So Deadline has a quote here. The gentleman's U.S. rights uh, were picked up by SDX for $7 million. For, like, you look who's in this movie, $7 million. Matthew McConaughey's in this movie. Uh, for $7 million bucks is kind of insanely cheap. Uh, and then the um, prints and advertising, which is quote-unquote marketing, budget was around 25 million dollars i don't know if that's worldwide or that's really low if it's worldwide i think that might just be domestic which makes a little bit more sense um so this thing's gonna make money uh where's it gonna end up it's at 11 now it's got decent scores so i think an, an average i would say a little bit above decent actually that i'm looking at it uh it's that definite recommend is kind of throwing it off a bit um i think you know 30 is is easy on this one domestic uh, maybe a little bit higher than that is it, it'll probably add theaters it, it opened a little bit depressed here in only 2165 theaters i would expect that to jump up a bit because of this performance i think uh but like you look at the per theater 5k that's pretty good for opening weekend but it's not great um but i think for what it is you look at that production budget this is a win this is definitely going to be profitable uh, you know, in the theater here. And then, of course, you got VOD streaming and all the digital stuff as well on the back end. So a uh, pretty good performance. Who went out to go see this? Uh, 60% of the audience was male, 40% female. Uh, over index on the male, just a bit. So normal audience is 55% male versus 45% female. Just overall movie going audience, men go more. Uh, under, under 25 was only 19%. Over 25 was 81%. Way over indexed on the over 25 crowd, which makes sense because like, there wasn't a ton of marketing for this, but like if you kind of grew up or you were like, you know, over the age of 10 when or 15 when Snatch came out, however long it was, like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, you know Guy Ritchie, you know what he's all about, you know his style. So it makes sense that older people would just connect with the trailer or the fact that this Guy Ritchie and know what it is. I think younger people are totally clueless to this guy and what, you know, what he's done in the past. So it's uh, there's a short memory there. So uh, I think that's why you over index on the over over 25 crowd uh, in terms of who liked it more uh, men. This is all from deadline, by the way, uh, guys liked it more than females, 82% positive versus 72% positive. Um, so yeah, I think it's gonna have a nice little run here. Uh, this is, you know, we always talk about January. Fuck you. It's January. If you guys watch um, uh, red letter, whatever the hell it is, uh, half in the bag, those guys from Wisconsin, uh, they're on YouTube. Uh, they have, there's some, it's called fuck you. It's January. Basically that like the studios don't care about you. They're dumping all their trash in January. And that's, what's essentially happening. Um, all the genre films are coming out like the grudge, um, like, uh, the gentleman, like, it's just, it's bad boys for life is kind of fits in that. Like, it's almost like a, we don't know if this is going to work. So let's just throw it out in January and see what happens. A doolittle was dumped. Um, Spies in Disguise, Like a Boss. I'm sorry, Spies in Disguise was holiday. Like a Boss definitely was dumped in January. Underwater is the perfect example of the January dump film. Uh, so it, what happens is that you have a lot of genre flicks that they're not sure at Cold Pursuit last year. They're not sure how they're going to do. So they put it out sort of in January, which makes it like a really exciting month because there's all this different type of stuff coming out. It's very crowded. A lot of different genres are, are getting thrown to see what sticks on the wall. Uh, and, mo you know, it's, you know, it, every year it's different how many succeed and don't succeed. A lot of them don't succeed. You know, like a boss didn't really work. Underwater's going to lose a lot of money. Uh, the grunge was a disaster. Um, but you have your winners. Everyone so the gentleman is a winner. Bad Boys for Life is a winter. Doolittle is a huge loss. But we knew that already. Uh... And so, you know, it's a very interesting month. So this is this is an example of a genre, uh, January dump film genre flick that works, right? Crime Caper, Guy Ritchie, we get it. Low cost, 
throw it out in January. If it makes $30 million, we're going to make a lot of money. And that's essentially what happened here with the gentleman uh, at number four. Number five was Jumanji. Again, what did I say when Jumanji was coming out? What did I say? We are never going to stop talking about this movie. I think until the day that I die, there's going to be a Jumanji movie coming out uh, in the holiday season and like having amazing legs all the way through February every single time. Uh, next level, again, down 19%. Who is seeing this movie? Who is seeing Jumanji the next level on January 24th, 2020? What is it, like two months after it came out almost? It just blows my mind. I, I honestly don't get it. Like when the first Jumanji made its run, I was like, this is special. This is lightning in a bottle. We're not going to see this again. This is the same thing. This is totally, same. it's not going to make $400 million. That's 283 now domestically, but it's the same pattern. It's that weird sort of in, you know, we're in the middle of January or the end of January and it's dropping 19% and it's still in 3000 theaters. Like someone's got to write a paper on it. Like maybe not a thesis, maybe it's not that level, but like there is a, a sort of pattern here and the ab uh, uniqueness and abnormality to how this thing is running right now. And it's like, it's got marathon legs every time. Why is that? Is it the rock? Is it Chris Hart? Is that why? Is it Jack Black? Maybe Jack Black is like the secret weapon in a movie. I don't know. Um, but it's doing fantastic. I mean, now again, it's not going to match the 400 of the original, but that did honestly feel that part of it felt like a lightning in the bottle opening up against, was it Force Awakens maybe? Or Last Jedi probably. Um, so uh, it's, you know, it, it's having a great run. And I think it's going to last. It just dropped 200 theaters now. Um, yeah, I think I'll have a good run through probably February 14th, the ho the Valentine's Day uh, sort of holiday. Uh, and then it'll probably be done. Um, okay, so that's number five. Number six, we're going to take some time on. So get settled, get your coffee. Um, the Turning from Universal. It's the second January uh, horror film we've gotten. It's a January dump film. Uh, so this is an interesting movie. So, um, you know, based on a book, uh, Steven Spielberg, this was his pet project, which I learned on Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. Uh, this was his pet project. Uh, they had an, another director assigned, another screenwriter, that almost got off the ground, but when the rewrite came in, which apparently was just a page rewrite, the changes were so drastic that Spielberg himself pulled the plug and said, we're not doing this with you two. We're finding another director and another writer, and we're going to move forward in a different direction. Uh, and that's essentially what happened. Uh, and let's get straight to the numbers here. So your uh, turning did 7.3 million this weekend. Um, the production budget was about $17 million. Um, and so it's not going to be like a hundred million dollar loss. It's going to be a disaster, but it's more of a creative disaster than anything. So here's a lowdown. Uh, critics ravaged the film. 12% Rotten Tomatoes, 20% from top critics. Verified audience score of a 13%. 13%. Uh, actual score of 34. All audience was 16%. Uh, these are horrific scores. And of course, most important of all, cinema score of an F. This is the second cinema score of an F we've gotten here in January 2020. There are 21 films all time right now that have received Fs. And we have two of them in this month, both horror films. Something is happening here, right? Uh, so uh, Letterbox score of a 38. Even the film snobs hate it. Uh, Grudge had a 32. Compared to the better horror films over the last couple of years, Midsummer had a 76, a set of 74. So what happened here is Spielberg essentially pulled the, pr pulled the plug, got a new director, got a new writer, I think they went with the original script or something like that. Uh, they shot this thing uh, and it's a complete and utter train wreck of a movie, uh, a post track of 10%. It was hovering around zero for a second there, I think on the initial sort of surveys. Uh, so essentially when you read the reviews, when you, I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but the ending's really bad and terrible and confusing. I'm going to read a couple of quotes from verified audience members, uh, a confusing, pointless, non-scary mess of a film don't waste your money in two hours of your life seeing this. Uh, someone else said, the most stupid and unfinished movie I've ever seen in my life. Please don't waste your money on this crap. Not even for free is it worth it. Uh, so just creatively, it's a, a total uh, mess here. And financially, they're going to lose money. They're not going to make anything on this. Maybe they'll break even. I doubt it because they had to pay a lot for marketing. Um, so what does this say? So we have a, I, I think the one reason why this... This feels like a bigger thing than just, oh, it's another failed horror movie. Is that we've had two horror movies get cinema scores of F in a single month. Something feels off about that. Something feels kind of abnormal or special or unique 
uh, as to what's happening here. And here's what I think. So I wrote this big, long essay about the state of horror uh, last year or actually two years ago, like October 2018. I spent a lot of time writing it and thinking about it. And I came to all these different conclusions. So look, look it up if you want to read it. It's on Medium. Uh, just look up Wildlife Podcast on Medium and it's there. It's a 20, 20 minute read. It's a little mini uh, novel there for you. Uh, but how I ended that essay, essentially the point of it was there's two golden ages going on in horror. Uh, there's the creative golden age, which would be It Follows, um, It Comes at Night, Raw, The Witch, or the four main movies that I was looking at, where uh, there's just been this unbelievable, Hereditary is another one, uh, this unbelievable creative renaissance in the horror genre coming from uh, different filmmakers, diverse filmmakers with different voices uh, that we had not seen in a very long time. And it's sort of a group of films came along around 2015, 2014, starting with It Follows, that really showed us and signaled a new way forward in horror. Uh, the The buzz phrase is elevated horror. I hate that. I don't think that's the right phrase here, but it's kind of those groups of films that we're talking about. So on the one hand, from about 2015 to 20, till now, it's still kind of going, there is this artistic renaissance in horror. So that was one golden age, and it really harkened back to like the 1970s, naturalistic horror, Wes Craven's Last House on the Left, uh, John Carpenter's Halloween, even Romero's Dawn of the Dead and Night of the Living Dead. It had this sort of gonzo, very raw, primal feel. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a perfect example of that, back in 74, I believe. So that was happening. It was really special. That was one part of the Golden Age. Then we had this box office boom of horror, uh, which was really the paradigm there was uh, it making over $100 million opening weekend in September 2017, when before, if a, a horror film hit the $100 million mark in total domestically, that would be a grand slam. This film hit it in the first two, three days. So, uh, and then we had Get Out do very, very well. Uh, and so um, Quiet Place as well, Don't Breathe, Lights Out. These films were all doing very well. So there was this sort of um, box office golden age for horror happening at the same time. I mean, it really being the paradigm shift. Uh, with that opening weekend and over $300 million domestically. So uh, at the end of the essay, I basically said, we're in a new era of horror. The genre totally changed. I don't know which way it's going to go, but it could probably go two ways. One is sort of the artistic side starts to blend a little bit more into the box office success. And I think we've seen that with Jordan Peele because Get Out's part of those original set of films that I think really pushed the genre forward. But uh, at the same time, a movie like also a huge box office success, Us feels like it even pushes it further, more artistic, more experimental, and also did really well. So I think that's kind of come true. The other thing that I said is that because it did so well, studios are going to pour gasoline on these movies and really light them up. And so I think that's also happened, and I think the fear that I had was that they're not really going to learn why these sort of movies like Raw and It Follows and The Witch are doing so well and are so interesting and why audiences are connecting with them, at least film nerds were, and, and film critics. I don't think they took those lessons and applied them to new horror films that they were making. They essentially just said, oh, horror is like really big now. Let's greenlight every horror film that we see. Uh, and that's why we've seen this this glut of um, The Nun, La Llorona, Pet Cemetery, Child's Play, all these reboots happening, a lot of them not very good. Those four films I just mentioned, are none of those are good horror films. They're terrible. Uh, none in La Llorona made a lot of money because of The Codring, but Child's Play, Pet Cemetery didn't do very well. The Grudge and The Turning kind of fit into this, uh, the studio greenlighting a lot, giving horror a lot of money, but not really learning the lessons of the creative renaissance that has happened in horror. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate because, um, you know, it's been uh, last year was a pretty good year in horror, I would say, like midsummer from a creative angle and us uh, from a creative and box office angle. But a lot of these sort of reboots and newer horror films, horror films are just not doing very well and they're not connecting. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think the turning is an example of what happens when a, a studio overcooks a genre that's hot is essentially what's happening. And we're, gonna, we're probably going to see more of these films, unfortunately, and that in turn is going to sort of uh, um, make studios not as excited about horror films, not greenlighting budgets for uh, 30, 40, 50 million dollars for a big budget horror film. Uh, I think Dr. Sleep is a perfect example of what happens when they screw it up, uh, not in terms of the quality of the film. I thought Dr. Sleep was actually really good and a great horror film. One of the bigger, better big budget horror films I think we've seen in the last decade. 
Uh, it wasn't perfect. It had some problems, but nobody showed up for it. Warner Brothers poured this money in this movie and they did, the marketing was a total shit show and people didn't show up. So I'm, I, I'm thinking as fast as they poured the gasoline or put their foot down on the pedal on the gas after it did so well. Now they're starting to look like Pet Cemetery. It too underperformed, I think. Uh, to expectations and now we have the grunge and the turning both getting f's in a single month i think studios are going to sort of pull back pretty significantly with the horror genre which is a fear that i had my fear was during you know whenever i wrote that was like fall of 2018 it was like horror can do no wrong it's like in this perfect place but i knew that it might that studios might screw it up and overdo it and not think about green lighting good directors with unique voices but just green lighting any horror film that they can to make a quick buck and they didn't really change the system that they were using all the way back to the 1980s uh, and it kind of feels like we're in a mini sort of down slump with these remakes and stuff none of them are very interesting they're not very good uh and so that turning is a part of that sort of shift in the whole genre uh okay but that's enough of a rant about that uh, i don't want to go on too long about um the turning well I, i'll probably see it let's be honest uh but it's a total disaster of a film and uh the ending i hear is just ridiculous uh okay before we got to kick over to chris here on the time machine but let's finish out the top 10 real quick uh star wars in number seven with five million across the 500 million dollar mark uh still a significant underperformance for that movie that kind of i don't want to say that the reboot this the new series but they do have a new series coming out uh you know i i think that uh they need to kind of now, go back to the drawing bar completely, but just approach Star Wars from a different angle. I would say more like Rogue One, but I am biased on that. Uh, number eight was uh, Little Women with 4.7 million, a 26% drop, uh, $93 million so far. It has overperformed, like I had said, but it's even gone much further than I thought it was going to do here. Uh, so Little Women's a great win for Greta Gorig and all the cast involved there. Uh, number nine, Just Mercy from Warner Brothers, $4 million, a 30% drop, uh, $27 million for this one, Missed Opportunity. You know, this thing had an A-plus cinema score should easily have been into the $50 million uh, range at this point. Should have been nominated for a lot of awards. It didn't get nominated because it didn't perform well. And I think that a lot of it had to do with the release schedule on it. Uh, it was too crowded maybe to push it out in early December or late November. Maybe an October push, something like that. It just didn't work. Where it worked with 1917 where they held on to the last moment to release it wide. It just didn't. Uh, just Mercy got drowned up by all the holiday films. Uh, and number 10, uh, Knives Out, uh, Lionsgate here. Uh, $151 million for this movie. Uh, what an overperformance here. I knew that it was going to break out, but I didn't think it was going to break out this much. Uh, so just wonderful um, numbers for Knives Out. Uh, so that is the top 10 awards chatter. Uh, let's skip it this week. Let's get let's kick it over to Chris right now. Who's going to talk about Time Machine 1990. Welcome to the Wildline Time Machine. My name is Chris. Thanks, Dan, as always, for having me on the Wildline podcast. Let's take a look at the past and future of the American box office. We're taking it back 30 years this week to the fourth weekend of 1990. Uh, always looking for those weird weekends to celebrate uh, 5 or 10 or 15, this time 30 year anniversary of, uh, let's talk about one movie that was everywhere in 1990 and two movies that uh, I never knew existed. Maybe one I think I recognize, the VHS cover from my trips of yore to Blockbuster and uh, Hollywood Video, and also the smaller video store rentals uh, in southeastern Wisconsin. But let's begin with the number one movie that was number one for uh, a, a crazy amount of weeks. It was out for seven weeks um, and it had kind of hovered towards the end of uh, the top 10 uh, throughout the month of December. And then uh, in late January, the Oscar nominations were announced and poof, it went to number one we're talking, yes, about 1989's Driving Miss Daisy. In its seventh week of release, previous week it was at number nine, and then it shot up to number one. Uh, everybody knew that this was going to be the movie to beat, and it kind of was uh, the only movie that a lot of people were thinking and talking about in the beginning of 1990. Put out by Warner Brothers, starring Jessica Tandy and Morgan Freeman, of the latter of which uh, um, secured a easy Oscar nomination win for his portrayal of uh, Miss Daisy's driver. Uh, 
kind of starting the tradition of um, that would go all the way through Green Book of last two years ago. Last year, I don't know. That's a one of the most that could have been a movie that came out in 1990. Um, yeah, it's such a weird little movie that could, and yet uh, you get the right kind of campaign behind it, and I think that's pretty much all that was, was just Warner Brothers putting all its eggs in its basket, and it just was just sentimental enough and just benign and innocuous enough to uh, become the Oscar movie of that year. Uh, this movie made over $16 million domestic, and it only cost... Uh, what did I look up here? Seven and a half million dollars to make. So this is a movie that, um, and then if you count the you know uh, video sales after that, it went way over a hundred million even. So it's kind of insane for uh, such a small movie. But as I just said, Green Book did kind of a similar thing uh, just this past year, right? Um, yeah, what's there to say about Driving Miss Daisy? Not too much. I actually want to spend more of my time here talking with you about Enemies, A Love Story, and Ski Patrol, the second and third uh, spots for that weekend back in 1990, two movies that I had no idea existed, to be honest. And, okay, so first off, let's talk about this strange little movie, Enemies, A Love Story, starring Ron Silver and Angelica Houston. Uh, once again, benign, innocuous, but here's the weird thing, and I try to do as much googling as I could to confirm this and it might be some kind of blip but I don't think it was I think that what was going on here this weekend is basically there was nothing new coming out and so the box office with the Oscar nominations being announced uh, just like went into complete chaos here's a movie that had already been out for seven weeks and 20th Century Fox and it was basically like a period it's like 40s New York City uh, story about this Jewish guy who uh, had married the girl who saved him during the war and then turns out that his wife who he thought had died in the war was alive and he's also cheating on his wife in New York and so it's just it's you know a and there's like wacky klezmer music in the background during the trailer which is borderline offensive but it's uh like once again, especially nowadays where it's all about spectacle, as Dan has talked about numerous occasions, uh, this is not a movie that you'd expect to go from previous week, 19th at the box office, to this week, number two at the box office. Absolutely insane. And it still only ends up grossing about $7.7 7 million. It made $5.2 million on this wackadoo weekend where it... Uh, pop to number two uh it was nominated for three academy awards including two nominations in the supporting actress category for both angelica houston uh who plays the wife that comes back from the dead and lena olin uh who was making her film debut here i believe uh or no no this is her second movie um as well as a best adapted screenplay uh nomination for roger l simon and paul mazursky mazursky also directed this is an interesting guy that i totally forgot was uh, kind of on the rise in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, he made uh, uh, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice in 69 and then kind of slowly rose in the background in Hollywood. And he made Down on Beverly Hills in 1986. And then he was also an actor and kind of uh, uh, leveraged that into his directing career. But then kind of just went nowhere after this movie, Enemies, a Love Story. Um, yeah. It's 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 very strange how these kind of career directors just fizzled out and you totally forget they existed even. OK, so let's talk about this weird movie Ski Patrol as well. This is the only 1990 movie of this uh, weekend to make it uh, to the top five. You also had uh, Born on the Fourth of July, Christmas Vacation still holding strong in the top four and five spots. Ski Patrol. The previous week, it was number 17 at the box office. It's in its third week of release here in the doldrums of January. Uh, Triumph Releasing Corporation. What the heck? All the other top 10 movies. It's Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers, Universal, 20th Century, Paramount. Triumph Releasing Corporation's putting out this crass, completely forgettable ski comedy sex comedy but it still manages to be pg what's going on here i don't know it ended up ma making only 8.5 at the box office but this very strange weekend like i said it's chaotic and it make pulls in 5.1 over 50 percent of its total gross you have a 
plus 115 percent increase uh, for Drive Miss Daisy. There's no drops here. 750 percent increase for Enemies Love Story. 362 percent increase for Ski Patrol. What? And obviously, Ski Patrol isn't a part of the the Oscar nominations. Uh, questionable campaigning and sudden rise in the box office numbers. Uh, but it was just kind of like, I don't know, you had the serious people going to the movies to see the serious movies. And uh, then you had you know everybody else just, I guess, grabbing a ticket for Ski Patrol to see uh, uh, a, one of the lead billing actors was a bulldog named Rascal playing a bulldog named Dumpster. Also, interesting factoid about this very forgettable a uh, movie about ski school instructors uh, trying to bed their co-eds that are some reason wearing bikinis on the slopes. Um, Paul Figg uh, plays one of the main ensemble players, uh, Stanley, in the movie. Uh, you got to check out this trailer on YouTube, guys. It's uh, it's it's pretty silly, and uh, it, it kind of, in a weird way, makes me a little bit, just a, a tiny bit, miss those days of being able to rely on. A, uh, Larry L. Zucker comedy uh, hitting the box office every once in a while. Obviously, the Waynes brothers took over for that. And then there was the even, it got progressively worse, right? Then you had like whoever those guys were that made disaster movie uh, after that. Um, but no, we, we just we just forget about that nowadays. I guess it still happens a little bit on streaming, but definitely not to the uh, scale that we were perhaps a, a little making not taking enough advantage of in the 90s i don't know that's that's going too far for sure the movies are all garbage uh overall 1990 box office um kind of a weird year for uh this kind of transition it means very symbolic is this transition in the box office industry from uh the kind of um novelty and uh neon uh you know greed and wealth obsessed 80s into the more kind of pragmatic and nostalgia of the 90s. And this is, of course, coming from a 90s guy. Uh, you had Ghost at the top of the box office, and you had uh, kind of really bad but still very iconic movies even making it into the top 20, like movies like Problem Child and Arachnophobia. Um, but you also had, like I said, the, like the more serious movies like Ghost and uh, Hunt for the Red October um, presumed innocent days of thunder. Uh, so yeah, 1990, what a year I, I have seen so many of these movies, but it's been so long and so many of them are bad and yet very, very memorable. Okay. Let's take a look at the future. Shall we? We have three movies I want to talk about. Um, I tried to uh, limit myself cause I think Dan's probably going to talk a lot about, um, the Sundance film festival, but I did want to mention one that caught my eye during all this coverage. I also want to talk about a movie that's coming out in March that uh, has is debuting as a new studio um, that we might want to keep an eye on. So let's begin there. There's a movie coming out in March in select theaters. Perhaps if a platform release, you know, depending on how the marketing goes, they'll they'll decide to go platform. But at least it's going to uh, make some noise in the box office nerddom because uh, it's a new, brand new. Distribu distribution company called Vital Pictures uh, teaming up with Enemy they are putting out their first release called Beneath Us starring Rigo and Roberto Sanchez directed by Max Pacman no names there though they both uh, Rigo and Roberto um, who I believe are unrelated uh, have been in a new a number of movies as the kind of the bit Latino players uh, but this is the first kind of big movie arguably other than La Llorona, um, that is going to be um, pushed as uh, a Latino market, but still with perhaps poised for a wide release eventually, once again, if the platform thing works out. Rigo Sanchez, known for his work in the um, movie and, T and TBS series Animal Kingdom. Uh, Roberto Sanchez was in Too Fast, Too Furious. You also have James Tupper from Big Little Lies. Uh, this is the, here's what got me is this is what sold me on including it and featuring it on uh, this week's time machine. This movie has quite a synopsis. The American dream becomes a nightmare for a group of undocumented day laborers hired by a wealthy couple. What they hope to be their biggest payday turns into a terrifying fight for survival at the couple's secluded mansion, and those thought to be helpless must prove they can't be discarded so easily. So it's like Ready or Not meets uh, Get Out. I don't know. This is this could be 
huge if it turns out to be of high quality. So I'm excited for this movie. Keep an eye on it. I think that uh, we'll uh, hear Dan talking about it come March when we are discussing limited releases. But uh, yeah, new mainstream and Vital Pictures, uh, brand new debut coming out sometime in March. Uh, Number two on my list here that I want to discuss, also not a Sundance movie, but uh, another announced A24 project. Uh, and as it, if it's not already apparent, both Dan and I are uh, stands of the A24 brand. Um, the makers of Swiss Army Man are putting out a new movie, Dan Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, who are kind of obnoxiously referred to uh, by A24's promo materials as the Daniels. Uh, they have a movie co- coming out called Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uh, it wasn't just A24 that come out here. It's also the cast. You have Michelle Yao and Jamie Lee Curtis as your leads. And you also have some other um, interesting uh, players in here, including uh, Kei Hui Kwan from Temple of Doom. Remember him? And uh, James Hong from Big Trouble in Little China. What's going on here? This is such an interesting and exciting cast, once again, for those of us nostalgic for the 80s. Um it's uh, actually a project that started with Joe and Anthony Russo of Avengers End- Endgame f- uh, fame. And they uh, made this kind of blind deal with uh, Quan and Shiner to get this uh, movie up and running. There's not a lot on the log line here. It's uh, basically uh, about a <laughs> corpse that uh, befriends a man stranded. Or no, let's say that's Swiss Army Man. No, there's nothing here about um, everything everywhere all at once other than it's a um, sci-fi comedy with dark undertones we'll find out more hopefully soon Uh, but I just want to mention that out there it's so interesting I was just wondering what happened to Michelle Yao as we were discussing uh, was it the world is not enough is that the Bond movie she was in Um, a few weeks ago here on the podcast last but not least let's talk about the one Sundance movie I want to make sure to mention I don't think Dan's going to mention it sorry if this is a repeat uh, Dan, but I, I know he's probably going to be talking more about uh, Wander Darkly or whatever that uh, Diego Luna, um, Sienna Miller movie is. W- fair enough. Yes, I, I'll definitely see this. But I, here's the movie I'm excited about that's coming out of Sundance. Um, it is not, it has not found a distributor yet, but I hope it'll get sold soon. It seems like it's getting really good reviews and good buzz online, including through Deadline. Um, Black Bear. Writer director Lawrence Michael Levine uh, is not is uh what is he known for um oh, it's not mentioned here i gotta look this up but you have aubrey plaza and christopher abbott aubrey plaza obviously of um, parks and rec fame christopher abbott from girls um but then also uh a third actor because here's the the log line uh it takes place in a remote lake house in the adirondack mountains it follows a couple that entertains an out-of-town guest looking for inspiration in her filmmaking as a result the retreat turns into an unexpected game of deception navigating self-awareness and vulnerability between the three artists the third actor is sarah gadon uh once again i'm i'm all about like these low stakes but high concept uh, thrillers, uh, Sarah Gadon, uh, known mostly for her work on Letterkenny, um, and I guess also a, a sequel to The Cutting Edge. Wow, I didn't know that existed. Um, it's exciting because you have obviously Sundance uh, is your go-to place for uh, indie romances and indie comedies, um, but I mean, I'm all I'm all about uh, these strange but uh, compelling thrillers. So uh, here's here's what we're looking at. We're looking at a ton of movies trying to fight for the same kind of space that that movie Beneath Us is looking for. And obviously not many of them are going to pop out or pop off. But this one could be. Oakhurst Productions uh, put this one together um, with uh, writer-director Lawrence Michael Levine. I think that's always a good sign, too, when you've got a writer-director um, behind it and it's not some kind of cobbled together mess. Uh, but who's, who knows who's to say Michael Lawrence, Michael Levine, uh, what is he known for? I'm looking it up for us right now, a little less, uh, prepared than I typically am. Um, wild canaries he made in 2014, uh, the VHS movies, uh, he made as well, which I've never seen, but heard good things about. And it, the movie uh, Gabby and the Roof of July was kind of his big breakout hit back in 2010. And he started with the indie dramas, but this is really exciting to see all this stuff coming out of Sundance this year. And it seems like we're getting more coverage than ever. 
keep an eye out for it. Thanks for listening as always. My name's Chris. This has been the Wildline Time Machine. Take it away, Dan. All right. Thanks for the time machine, Chris. That was awesome. 1990, 30 years ago. What is going on? How old am I now? Um, what's interesting about that that sort of breakdown is that uh, I remember Ski Patrol very well. Uh, Ski Patrol was like um, one of those movies that was on like late night Cinemax for a long time, all throughout the 90s, which I stayed up watching constantly as a teenager. Uh, so I've seen Ski Patrol many, many times, uh, too many times that I actually want to admit. Um, so I know that one. Driving Miss Daisy, you know, kind of reminds me of one of those films that growing up in the 1990s, uh, you would know Driver Miss Daisy. As, even as a young kid, you would have known that film. It won Best Picture in 1990. Uh, it beat out the likes of Born on the Fourth of July, Dead Poet Society, Field of Dreams, and My Left Foot, which looking at now is sort of like, we think that like, we think that, oh, films are always better. But you look at that group of Best Picture noms, you're like, these are all okay films, but like you wouldn't put them up with a lot of the best stuff uh, that comes out today, would you? I mean, maybe My Left Foot would. But Driving Miss Daisy is like one of those major studio films about racism that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense probably to younger people now if they saw it because it'd just be like wait what like the entire movie like it used to be what way and of course it's the hollywoodification of what racism was in atlanta in the 19 whatever it is 60s to the 70s early 70s uh so it's like it's just such a bizarre film and it's gonna be one of those films that i think you know younger people let's say under 30 when they're sort of looking back on what was be- what won Best Picture and what was really sort of held up as a great film, they're going to look at this one and be like, what are you talking about? It's really not that good. And I would have to agree with that. It's well written. It's well produced. It's well acted. It just is not Best Picture worthy at all. Uh, it's essentially like Green Book winning, let's be honest. Um, uh, great new films to talk about. I had no idea about Vital Pictures. That's really cool. Uh, it's all about, um, you know, getting Latin and Latinx representation in the film industry uh, in front of and behind the camera, which is amazing. That log line sounds fantastic uh, for Beneath Us. Um, even someone on Deadline's comments said, I saw a cut of this in San Diego and it was awesome. So it sounds like it could be a really cool movie. And I love talking about new distributors and new companies. So I think there needs to be more out there. Um and it's funny that Chris mentioned Black Bear because uh, I've been going through this weekend is Sundance, Sunday through today. Uh, and I go through each day and sort of look through reviews and kind of pick out stuff. And actually, I made a spreadsheet of movies to sort of track and just keep tracking throughout the year because you do you do lose track of these movies. Sundance isn't like Can- Con Film Festival and it isn't like Telluride or TIFF or the New York Film. It's not like that. It's a little bit more on the indie side and still has always been that way. Uh, it used to be more fireworks and stuff 10, 15 years ago, uh, but now it's kind of gone back to its roots and really sticking with indie stuff and kind of a, a lot of unknown people uh, releasing films. Uh, uh, Black Bear came up on my radar immediately. Uh, I saw a review of it. I think um, I forget what it was like Indie Wire, I think, had a good review of it. I read through it was like, mm, this sounds interesting. Uh, Audrey Plaza is uh, I love her uh, as an actor. Like, she was so good in Ingrid Goes West. I never really understood her shtick. Like, when she'd go on talk shows and stuff in Parks and Rec, I was like, I just don't get it. You're, like, really unpleasant. And is that is that, like, an act? Is that, like, a comedian? Is this, like, is your entire life performance, performance art or something? I, did, I didn't really, it didn't really click for me. But I think there's a lot of sort of earnestness and seriousness underneath that. And you saw that Ingrid Goes West. She was just, I think, really amazing in that movie. Uh, and I look really look forward to what she's doing next. And Black Bear just seems like a, a really interesting film. Uh, and even more so than Audrey Plaza, I would say, I'm really interested to see what Christopher Abbott's about. Uh, he was the guy in, plays Marnie's boyfriend in Girls. I haven't seen him in a ton of stuff outside of that. I just remember that episode of Girls. I watched the entire series. I don't remember a lot of it. But one episode I remember the most is when Marnie meets up with him again. I, I want to say it's in the last season or something. And they had been broken up for a while. And he's like addicted to heroin or something. But like it was a really magical episode and he was so good in it. Uh, And I really look forward to see what him and Audrey Plaza can do in this. And 
um, and the other people involved. The log, uh, the review here from Entertainment Weekly, which is a magazine I used to subscribe to as a young man, uh, it actually got me into film and, and, and uh, box office in general. Uh, so I got a shout out to Entertainment Weekly. This is their sort of sentence on it. Uh, fueled by surprise and layered with an intoxicating dream logic, Black Bear is the kind of discovery you hope for at Sundance. Wholly unexpected, compellingly demanding, utterly unique. Uh, so that sounds awesome. Uh, so I'm super psyched about that. It's in my spreadsheet, so I'm gonna I'm gonna check on it every couple of months and see when I can see it. Uh, okay, so that was Time Machine. That's the top ten. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what's coming out over the next few weeks. Um, so we had three or two new wide releases this weekend. Uh, we have Gretel and Hansel next weekend. The rhythm section. Uh, as well. Also, the 2020 Oscar shorts will be out in your local theater for the most part, I think. Uh, so check those out. Uh, Gretel Hansel, I have no idea now. Like, I thought that the turning was going to pop off. I was clearly wrong about that. I I, I think there's a chance for Gretel and Hansel. Or maybe, maybe we'll get a third F Cinema score for a horror film in a single month. It is possible. It looks super arty. It looks like The Witch. It looks like it comes at night. It looks like that horror renaissance stuff that I was talking about. Elevated horror, barf. Uh, but it lo- has that look, a very arty Mandy would be another sort of reference there. Um, uh, so is there a story there? Is it actually good? Are people going to flip out when they see it? I think it's got a good chance of breaking out now because turning really screwed up. So I think maybe people are like going to be hungry for horror movies or maybe they're t- totally turned off by it. Rhythm section, I was not keen on uh, recently, but I saw a new trailer. It looks good. I love Jude Law. Um uh, and I think Blake Lavie is a great actor, so I think that uh, I think it has a chance to do pretty well. It's just the worst name ever. Uh, then we're into February. We got Birds of Prey coming out. That's tracking at like fifty something. I want to say. Uh, of course, there's incels going after it, which is so stupid. They're not going to prevent this movie from doing well. It might prevent itself from doing well. I mean, the trailers are not good on this. And maybe I'm just being like overly critical as a comic book movie skeptic sometimes. Uh, it just doesn't look like it has a hook to it. Uh, so maybe it does 50, maybe it does 100. I don't know. Uh, my guess is it's going to underperform the expectation. A large horror film coming out on Neon, also that we can limit it. Uh, then we have a lot. Uh, Downhill, Fantasy Island, Photograph, Sonic the Hedgehog, What About Love, all on the 14th, which is, of course, Valentine's Day. So it's going to be a big Valentine's Day weekend holiday. Um and then, you know, what are those going to do well? I think Downhill is going to do okay. It is a, you know, you got um, two big name stars in it. Uh, it's a remake of, I want to say, is it a French film maybe? Uh, uh, Searchlight Pictures, which is uh, re- the renamed Fox Searchlight Pictures. is now Searchlight Pictures. So stupid. I don't know what Disney's thinking. Uh, I don't know how it's going to play, though. I don't see it popping off huge. Fantasy Island, I think, could be big. Uh, that's actually kind of turns into a horror film, if you see the trailer. Uh, photograph, eh. uh, I think Sonic the Hedgehog is somehow trending in the 40s. I don't know. My nephew, Charlie, is like five years old. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, really loves it, right? Like, he he's super into it. He, he's five years old. Like, he doesn't, what, how does he know about this thing at all? Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog was, like, big in the 90s when I was uh, a kid. So, I don't know. Apparently, there's this whole second generation, younger generation of children who are into this. So, it could do, could do well. Uh, after Valentine's Day, to close out. Uh, also... Uh, to note, for you art movie fans, uh, it's not going to make any money at the box office, but Portrait of a Lady on Fire officially is released in the United States on the 14th. Uh, if you like film at all, just go see it. It's just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen uh, in, in film. It's just gorgeous. Uh, but no one's going to see it, of course. Uh, and then, um, let's see, Brahms the Boy 2? What? From SDX on the 21st? Oh, horror film. I forgot the boy came out. I had to go look that up the other day. I was like, what is this? Uh, Call of the Wild. Uh, Harrison Ford's way too old to be in this. So I don't know what they're thinking. Uh, 20th Century Studios uh, is the studio there. No longer Fox 20th Century or 20th Century Fox Studios. Another uh, new name. And then the Invisible Man closes out February. February 14th is really the peak of that month. And then it gets really quiet. Uh, all the way until uh, until March there. Anyway, thanks for listening, folks. This has been the Wildland Podcast. I will be back with Chris next week. 